Welcome back. In this video I'm going to talk about how we can compare the means between different groups or different conditions. Um, I already have an earlier video talking about a case where we just compare two groups or conditions. So this is about situations where we have more than two. To do that, I'll actually briefly recap for how we deal with situations where we have two groups or conditions. And in that, talk again about the difference between, uh, between participants and the in-participants design, because that's a key topic in this area. Um, and then I'm going to extend it to multiple means, again to conditions where we have a between-participants design and an in-participants design. Um, and then also talk about some of the statistical inferential difficulties associated with comparing lots of different groups in the same paper, in the same study. So as an example, it is throughout, let's look at how memory, how test scores are affected by background music. And the first question to ask there is, what's our design? Is it repeated measures or independent samples? Between participants, shown on the um, screen here, is when you have independent samples. We have one group studying with music, one group who's studying without music. Alternatively, we could run the study um, as a study where everyone takes part in both conditions, and that's then called the in participants or repeated measures. Those two situations lead to slightly different statistical questions. So if we have independent samples, then the question just is, are the results in the two samples different from each other? When we have repeated measures, it's actually a little bit more complicated. The other question then is whether the mean of the differences for each individual participant, whether those means differ from zero. The reason for why the question is framed in a slightly different way in the second case is because we now have pairs of scores that are caused both by the conditions but also just by individual differences in the participants. So we are no longer just comparing two sets of scores or we are now comparing one set of different scores. So to answer the question whether it's a difference we need to run um, formal significance tests. Those allow us then to conclude whether whatever we observe in our sample is likely to apply to the population that the sample is drawn from. In case of two groups, those tests are t-tests, but they are a bit different depending on whether we have repeated measures or independent samples. Now moving on to multiple groups, we again have to face the question so let's, let's think about extending this study to four, four different groups. We again have to face the question, do we do this? The separate samples for each of the four conditions? Or do we expose the same participants to the four conditions? Let's first look at independent samples. Let's imagine we run this with independent samples, 25 participants per group. Um, then we get results. And those results now describe our outcome in this one experiment, but we're interested in now making inferences about a broader population. We have two inferential questions to answer. The first question is, well, do we actually have evidence that these conditions have some impact? This is called an omnibus test. So first we're interested in, do the results differ depending on what conditions the participants are in? If we can say yes at that point, then the next question is, which of the conditions are actually different from each other? There might be some, some difference in these conditions, but maybe not all four are actually different from each other. So there we're doing pairwise comparisons. We're looking at pairs of conditions, trying to figure out whether they are different. So to answer the first question, whether the conditions collectively make a difference, we put them into a model, and we try to see whether that model explains a significant amount of the variance. It's called analysis of variance. Sometimes it's seen as a completely different technique. 
But in fact, this comparison of a model against the null model is something that's, that we need to do for any model, for a normal linear regression model, we also need to do this. The way it works is um, that we use a distribution that's called the f-distribution to see whether the share of variance that our model explains is significantly different from nothing, from no, no additional variance explained by our model. Um, for this f-distribution we need two parameters, so it's always reported with these two parameters. One is the model decrease of freedom, which just is the number of parameters, and then the error decrease of freedom, which is what remains of our sample size after we have taken uh, the number of predictors out. Um, if this test is significant for the model that we've just put all the conditions in, then we can say the conditions in general do make a difference. It's very easy to do that in R. It's literally just about running a standard linear model. That linear model gives us an f-statistic and that f-statistic indicates whether um, the model is actually better than a null model, and a null model is generally that that just estimates every participant as being on the overall mean. So if we run the LM model, we get this F statistic at the very bottom, and in this case we can see, based on the p-value, that it is highly significant. So at this point we would just report the score differed uh, depending on the condition the participants were assigned to them, and then report the F score with the two degrees of freedom. That might be interesting, but ultimately when we have more than two groups we clearly want to know where those differences are. So we want to know which conditions differ. We already get some insight from the LM model here, because that model already uh, reports three t-tests. Those t-tests are testing whether and the three conditions listed here are different from the reference category, so the condition not listed here, which in this case is silence. So we might be tempted to conclude that two of them are different, one is not. But there are three more comparisons to think about between the conditions that are listed. And we need to be careful of these p-values because we're making so many comparisons. That is the idea of family-wise error rate comes in. It's a very important concept whenever we test more than one quite similar hypothesis. Because we want to be confident in our research, we want to be 95% confident that our data is inconsistent with the null hypothesis. And if we test similar hypotheses, we want to be sure or confident rather across all of them. If we now think of an example of testing six hypotheses, like we, like we now do between those, those three groups, and if we test them independently, then the chance of, chance of getting them all right, if we have a 95% likelihood of getting each one right, is 95 to the power of 6. 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95 and so on. That is actually only 73.5%. So if we just test them, we have an up to 26.5% chance that we report a false positive. Clearly that's inacceptably high, so we need to do something about it. We want to limit it to 5%, and the way to get there is to decrease the alpha level, to be stricter for each individual hypothesis. And the easiest way, and therefore one of the most common ways to do it, is just to divide the alpha level by the number of tests the so-called Panferroni correction, so we divide po the, the 0 0.05 alpha level by 6, get an adjusted alpha level of 0 0.0083, and we now use that as our decision threshold. We, if we now repeat the calculation I just showed you, um, and take the adjusted likelihood of being correct in, in rejecting, uh, to the power of 6, we see that we only have a 4.9% chance of getting something wrong, which is what we want. So when we have multiple comparisons, we need 
to control for the family OS error rate, generally we're adjusting the alpha level. How do we now get the comparison of all the six conditions? Well, we use the pairwise t-test command, and they say that we want to test the scores grouped by the condition factor, and we wanted to adjust the p-values based on the Bonferroni correction. What R does in this case is that it multiplies each p-value by 6. So here it's going the other way around from what I just explained. But conceptually, it's exactly the same. Um, the p-values are multiplied by 6 to make sure that across all of them uh, we don't get too many false positives. And we can see, well, in fact, we only have two significant differences. Right now, only vocals and silence are different, so vocal music versus silence. And white noise is also better than vocals. All the other ones, in particular silence versus instrumental and vocal versus instrumental, are just about not significant because of this correction. Um, and if we did this, we would report um, that we adjusted the p-values for six comparisons. An equivalent way of doing it is to um, not adjust the p-values and then to say that we adjusted our um, decision criteria. Kind of a matter of your preference, both is done in published research I personally find this way around a bit more transparent because it's just clear what the p-values mean. Um, yeah, you just need to be very clear how you adjusted your data. What we can see, however, now is that when we looked at it in the beginning, at the data, we saw some pretty big differences between the conditions. Now we can only conclude that two of the six comparisons actually yield significant result. So how can we increase statistical power and make sure that we don't get false negatives here? Um, so we need to be aware that if we do many comparisons, the effective alpha level will become very low, will become very stringent. One way to avoid that is to reduce the number of comparisons. The difficulty with that is that of course it's very easy to cheat with that. So now we could say, well, we did, we did six comparisons, two were clearly not significant. Now let's just say those two were never planned. So we only do four comparisons, we raise our alpha level and maybe the others become significant. That's of course not what you can do. So this idea of planned comparisons is to really pre-register in advance and say, well, actually in this research, I only care about comparing the three noise conditions to silence. I don't care about anything else. If we had done that in this case, we would be able to conclude that instrumental music is actually worse or reduces the test score compared to silence. Since we didn't do it and ran all six conditions, also comparing the noise conditions to each other, we can't conclude that. We can also consider using a different method for, for the adjustment of the alpha level. So there is the Holm-Bonferroni method that's actually just better than the Bonferroni method. It's a bit more powerful statistically, but it's also more complicated. So there usually what people do is run both, see if there's a difference, usually there isn't, and then stick with the simpler Bonferroni method. If you want to try out the Holm-Bonferroni method, the, the name for it in R, in the p-adjust argument, is just whole. Um, but apart from that, there isn't much we can do. If we have lots of conditions that we want to compare, we just need to accept that that reduces our statistical power, so we'll need a larger sample size in most cases. Um, if we now try to do the same research repeated measures, let's actually simulate what happens if we only have 25 participants overall rather than 25 per category. Okay, you can again look at the simulated scores um, that unsurprisingly are uh, different in the ways that we would expect it because it's simulated that way. But how would we now test this given that it's now repeated measures? 
the omnibus test becomes a bit more difficult because one of the main assumptions of linear models is violated. In a linear model, each observation needs to be independent. Observation 1 cannot be more related than to, than to any observation than to others. Clearly it's violated here, because we always have four observations that are quite closely related. The four observations for participant 1 are quite closely related to each other, the four observations for participant 2 and so on. So we need to make sure that we account for this uh, dependence of the observation before we can test whether our groups or our conditions actually matter. Um, that requires a so-called multi-level model. The idea of a multi-level model is that we have variables at different levels. So we have just a very simple participant identity variable at a participant level, and then we have four scores within each participant. In this particular case, you can also run a repeated measures Anoba model, which is a special case of the multi-level model. So in my mind, it makes more sense to just learn how to do multi-level models, because they are also relevant in many other situations. For example, like in the social survey data we look at, respondents are nested within countries. So if we want to model it properly, we would have to do exactly the same and say, well, with respondents on one level, we have the country on a higher level. Anyway, here we need to do it because our observations are not independent from each other. But then the omnibus test follows exactly the same logic. We see whether adding the groups to the model makes it any better. So to fit that model in R, we cannot use LM because LM only works with independent observations. Um, we need to use a special function for, for mixed, uh, for multi-level models. Um, one of the best ones comes from this LME4 package. Um, and it's very similar to the single level uh, linear models. So here we fit a model to predict the score based on condition and based on an intercept for each participant. The idea behind that is each participant has a different baseline um, memory ability in this case. That we need to account for. Once we have accounted for that, we can estimate the impact of each group. But now this model has two predictors in it. It has the participants in it and it has the groups in it. So we cannot just compare it to a null model. We need to compare it to a model that is the same apart from the groups. So our baseline model here has the participant factor in it. And we need to compare those two models. To compare two models, we can use the ANOVA function. Um, the output here is actually quite complicated because there are lots of different indices for comparison. But the only thing we really need to look for is whether the model that contains the groups is significantly better. And that's indicated by the p-value here at the end. So we can conclude that um, which situation the participants were in made a difference with regard to their score. Now if you want to compare the conditions, it's actually a lot uh, closer to what we did before again. The only thing we need to do is to add paired equals true, because all we're doing once we've done the omnibus test is just run, run uh, t-tests. We, we have paired t-tests, so also the pairwise t-tests can be paired. Um, if we do that, we can see, well, this time we actually have four significant results and only two non-significant results, which fits in with our idea that repeated measures designs are more powerful than independent samples designs. So what to remember? If we compare multiple means, we need to think about whether the design is independent samples or repeated measures. And then we usually need to answer two different questions. One question is, does this group factor that I have make a difference overall? That's the so-called omnibus test. If it does, then which of the conditions are different? And that's where we run pairwise comparisons. 
We don't always run all of them. In some cases, we really shouldn't. So we might ask, does the level of uh, religious belief depend on the country in the European Social Survey? In that case, we would really want to think in advance about which pairwise comparisons we're interested in. Because if, if we run all of them, we're just very unlikely to find significant results among all the noise. Um, to do these two kinds of tests, um, the omnibus testing is basically asking whether the model that uses the groups explains more of the variance than the model that doesn't. Um, and that's a statistical test that if we have a repeated measures design is automatically provided um, by the LM function. Um, if we have a, sorry, if we have an independent samples design, it's provided by the LM function. If we have a repeated measures design, it's a bit more complicated, but it's still fairly straightforward to extract from the multi-level model functions. For the pairwise tests, the most important thing to consider is that we need to adjust the alpha level to make sure we don't get too many false positives out of it. And the most common adjustment there is the Bonferroni correction, which just divides the normal alpha level by the number of comparisons we make. Please do take a, take a moment to think back on this and ideally note down the questions that you still have so that we can address them all in class. See you there.